Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Rudy Tixon. I'm with the Law Society of Upper Canada, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our annual Pride event at the Law Society. This event is organized by the Law Society's Equity Initiatives Department and our partner, the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Section of the Ontario Bar Association. I would like to thank the uh, SOGIC, as they're called, for their help in organizing this event. We are pleased to present today's events that will feature a panel discussion with a panel of legal experts and human rights advocates who will discuss the topic promoting lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights as human rights. The application of international human rights principles in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. This event is part of the Law Society's Equity Public Education Series, which is one of our key initiatives to encourage the exchange of information, ideas, and action on topics relevant to Aboriginal, Francophone, and equality-seeking communities. At this time, I would like to introduce the Chair of the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Section of the Ontario Bar Association, Adrian Lomaga. Um, Adrian, uh, who is a personal injury lawyer in Toronto, uh, was called to be Chair of the SOGIC in 2012. Uh, Adrian is also a board member of EGAL Canada, and he is the, a representative on the St. Michael's Hospital Ethics Committee. Uh, so if uh, now that I have the formality and seriousness out of the way, <laughs> I'm going to start the fun with uh, Adrian, who will introduce to you uh, our um, special uh, discussion moderator and our speakers and guests uh, for today, who will be introduced to you by our moderator. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for being with us here this afternoon. Uh, as you may well know, SOGIC, together with the Law Society, has been jointly hosting this annual conference to celebrate the achievements made by the LGBTQ community and to take note of the important work that still lies ahead. The OBA is very grateful to the Law Society for generously sponsoring this event, and we thank you. Most importantly, the OBA and the Law Society would like to thank each and every one of you. Thank you for your interest in this program and for taking the time to come out today. We hope that you enjoy today's conference and that you'll be able to join us at a reception immediately following the event. It is open to everyone. If you can't stay long, do take a moment or two to come by as Premier Wynn will be making an opening address. Let me now introduce our moderator. From the halls of Parliament Hill, to the red carpet of the Academy Awards, to the streets of Toronto and Vancouver, Michael Serapio has had the opportunity to interview politicians, celebrities, and Canadians across this country. Michael began his career as a producer and was twice nominated for a Gemini in recognition of his work. But Michael always wanted to be a reporter, so he embarked on a new career path, hosting a news magazine show on Pride Vision Television. He then worked in British Columbia and in Toronto for CTV, Toronto One, and City TV. Since 2010, Michael joined CBC News, where he started as a breaking news host. Michael now anchors weekend mornings on CBC News Network. Please help me welcome Michael Serapio. What Adrian has failed to tell you is that we were also neighbors. So uh, my being here probably has less to do with my qualifications and more with proximity, but uh, happy to be here. And despite the fact that this is the only Pride event where you don't wear t-shirts and shorts, I'm still very happy to be here. <laughs> uh, but welcome uh, to today's uh, discussion with our panel. Uh, I want to go over the agenda with you because we have a couple of hours here where we'll be hearing from our speakers, but uh, just to give you an idea how things are going to un fold as the afternoon goes. Uh, each speaker on our panel today will each present their perspectives on today's topic. We will then have a roundtable discussion with the panel. 
And then we want to turn it over to you and give you an opportunity to uh, speak with the panel, to ask the panel your own questions. So as you hear them speak, perhaps you want to, uh, you're lawyers, you have a pen, you have a pad, write your questions down, feel free to ask it at the end uh, when the panel is done speaking. Uh, now we do have microphones uh, on the floor and we do ask if you are able to, to uh, walk to one of those microphones and through uh, those microphones ask your questions. Uh, we can also bring the microphone to you if you prefer. But one thing you should know uh, is that this session is being recorded so that it can be broadcast on the internet at a later date. So you must speak into the microphone to have your comments recorded and to ask questions. Uh, a couple things to know there. Now, we also, a uh, bit of housekeeping here for you. Uh, we have a copy of an evaluation form in front of you. And at some point during the program, please feel free to fill out and drop it off at the registration table outside. The Equity Initiatives Department of the Law Society and SOGIC would like your feedback about today's program in order to evaluate its effectiveness and to, listen, to solicit ideas for future uh, programs and discussions. And someone said they were going to write down that I need TV training. I know who you are. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, let me now begin by introducing the people that you see upon the stage here. And I'm going to begin at the far end uh, with Michael Batista, uh, a lawyer since 1992. The breadth of Michael's ex uh, expertise includes matters related to same sex relationships, including sponsorships based on same sex relationships, HIV, and medical inadmissibility and skilled worker applications by people seeking to obtain Canadian permanent residence for them or their same sex partners. Michael is certified by Ontario's Law Society as a specialist in immigration and refugee law. Michael is a partner at Jordan Batista LLP and leads the firm's services in immigration refugee law. Michael has appeared as witness before the House of Commons and Senate on issues of immigration, such as expansion of the family class to include same-sex families. He worked with Canada's national LGBT equity group, EGAL, in successfully lobbying the Canadian government to extend immigration rights on same-sex couples, to same-sex couples, rather, and is a frequent commentator on a broad range of immigration issues in the media. I've used him myself a couple of times. Uh, now, from Michael, I'm going to move over to another Michael here, a bit further down. Give away fellow Michael. <laughs> Michael Charles, uh, fellow gentleman with a nice smile there. Michael Charles is a lawyer in Ontario. I've known him for a while, I can say that. <laughs> and is a management consultant and principal at Change Design. Change Design is a consulting firm with a uh, service focus in diversity and inclusion and organizational development. He is among Canada's diversity and inclusion thought leadership and has a proven ability to influence people, build collaboration, and contribute to excellence in outcomes. Michael is a leader in community capacity building and governance. He currently serves on the Canada Committee for Human Rights Watch. Past service this includes uh, directorships and executive directorships on the Boards of Skills for Change, an Immigrant Settlement Agency, and the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund Canada, respectively. Now, prior to launching the consultancy, Michael practiced civil litigation and family law for more than 10 years at the boutique Bay Street firm of David Charles Barrister's Professional Corporation. Lee Waldorf over to the other end again, and thank you for waving, Lee. Um, Lee is the Special Advisor in Women's Human Rights at the Stephen Lewis Foundation. Prior to joining the foundation, Ms. Waldorf worked with the United Nations at UNICEF, UNIFEM, and UN Women as a Global Policy Advisor on Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Ms. Waldorf is a member of the Ontario Bar Association and a former member of the Body Politic Collective. Over, one over from Lee, we have Mark Berlin. Now, Mark, you have a fan club. <laughs> um, you know, smart idea. I'm going to start bringing, walking with an entourage myself. <laughs> now, Mark Berlin is a professor of practice at McGill University's Institute for the Study of International Development. He was appointed to the Law Commission of Ontario in 2012. Now, Michael has a very long list of accomplishments. I'm just going to highlight. Uh, sorry, Mark. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> It's my list of accomplishments I'm about to read. Sorry, apologies, Mark. Uh, long list of accomplishments here, and I'm going to read them out for you, uh, just a few of them. Uh, General Counsel, Institute on Governance, Director General, Department of Justice, International Legal Program Section, Senior General Counsel and Special Advisor to the Deputy Attorney General of Canada, Special Advisor on the Middle East to the Minister of Justice, Departmental Legal Advisor to three previous Attorneys General of Canada, Senior Counsel, Criminal Law Policy, Department of Justice, Director, Race Relations and Multiculturalism with Multiculturalism Canada, Adjunct Professor of Faculty of Law, University of Ottawa. I think your phone number is here. I could read that too. 
<laughs> anyway, so Mark has a long list of accomplishments. And then last but not least, Marcella Romero, Regional Coordinator for the Latin America and Caribbean Network of Transgender People. And Marcella Romero is an Argentinian activist and human rights defender for the transgender population in Latin America and the Caribbean. She serves as a Regional Coordinator for the Latin American and Caribbean Network of Transgender People, an organization established in 2005 to provide a positive representation of the transgender community in Latin America. Marcella also serves as director of the Argentinian Association of Transvestites, Transsexuals, and Transgendered People, where she was a driving force for the movement of public health care professionals in hospitals throughout the city of Buenos Aires, referring to trans-identified people with a generic name. Her work also includes developing strategies to tackle stigma, hate crimes, discrimination, and human rights abuse against the trans population in Latin America. Currently, Marcella is supporting projects to advocate for gender identity identity laws in Bolivia, El Salvador, Brazil, and Guatemala. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel. So Mark, because you have a fan base, you're first up. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction. It just makes me sound a lot older than I am, but there you go. Um, have you been watching any of the reality sort of variety shows, um, America's Got Talent or any of those shows like that? And they always talk about a triple threat, somebody who can sing, act, and dance. Well, I'm sort of my own triple threat in the international field. I'm short, Jewish, and gay. And <laughs> frankly, <clears throat> not always a great combination when you're trying to promote human rights uh, on the international level. My focus today will be on how I've practiced um, in the area of the rule of law, uh, human rights rich lords, and specifically LGBT uh, rights. My perspective that I'll share with you this afternoon will be both as uh, a government uh, bureaucrat uh, and, and federal government diplomat, as well as an activist and lobbyist. In the government, I was, I was the um, Director General for International Law at the Department of Justice. And there I was responsible for about a $45 million program um, working to promote democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and good governance in failed and fragile states. And I'll explain to you a little bit more about that. Essentially, that meant that I was establishing Department of Justice many offices uh, to help reconstruct justice systems in places such as Bangladesh, Sudan, the Palestinian Authority, Ukraine, uh, Jamaica, amongst other countries. Many of the ones that I mentioned, or a number of the ones that I mentioned, are obviously Muslim countries. <clears throat> and most often, these are places that have government-sanctioned homophobic policies. As well, what I want to talk to you about today is my work as, uh, so let's call it a lobbyist activist, as chair of the national section of uh, SOGIC, the Gay, Lesbian, Transgender, Bisexual section of the Canadian Bar Association the work that we've done uh, through the Bar Association to promote these rights as well. And so as you can see, as we'll do this little travel, trip travel uh, along with me this afternoon, um, diplomacy was not always an easy dance for somebody who had a triple threat, such as myself. But let me start in the context of where the world's most, uh, where, the, where the world's human rights violations take place the most. Here I'll divide the world into three places for this afternoon's purposes. One, I'll talk about failed and fragile states. Second, I'll talk about essentially totalitarian authoritarian regimes. And finally, I'll talk about Western democratic societies. Well, first, failed and fragile states. What's a failed and fragile state? Well, a failed and fragile state doesn't really have a particular definition. But you can imagine these are uh, areas of the world, states or entities that have nascent forms of government. They're either emerging from war, uh, post-conflict situations, they may have gone through civil wars, they may have been created, entities or states created, created out of war. And so these are areas that are just emerging in, into our sense of what would be principles of good governance. And you need to understand that for the most part, the gravest situations facing the LGBT community are not taking place in Western democratic societies. 
subject to what I have to say a little bit later on when I talk about Western democratic societies. Now here in the West, when there are real or perceived violations of human rights, there are a number of avenues of redress that we could seek, usually, as you know, ending up in the courts. Not so, however, in places that have rampant corruption and a barely functioning government, or in places that have newly functioning government entities not used and not practiced in adjudicating human rights violations, or even acknowledging that human rights violations are taking place. So you have to understand from a contextual point of view, in those areas, it's completely mindset, completely uh, light years away from what we understand here in a Western democratic society. And so to start with, my thesis really is, is that before we can assert LGBT rights, essentially there needs to be a building block of technical legal assistance and the establishment of basic governance structures in these places. I have to say that sadly it's of little practical use and indeed futile to assert LGBT rights in the absence of a good government structure, in the absence of an established, efficient, effective working system, working justice system, how do you assert your legal rights? How do you assert that your human rights have been violated? How do you assert that international norms of recognized rights for LGBT individuals need to be asserted in a place where there is no governance? If a foreign government does not have a working legal system, then demanding adherence to international standards and basic fundamental human rights becomes an extraordinarily challenging matter, as you might well imagine. And so, in my mind, it's first critical that there is a functioning justice system put in place. However, in most post-conflict situations and failed and fragile states, this is not always available. My thesis really is the following, that the first line of defense is the establishment of a justice system that enables citizens to understand their rights and to ensure that members of society can protect their domestic and international rights through a legal system. It's clear then that the rights that we assert here in Canada are able to flourish in our system of democracy as underscored by the rule of law. And so how do you go about advocating for human rights and LGBT rights in areas of the world where democracy and the rule of law are simply but an aspiration? And that's the crux of why so much effort is being spent to promote democratization and the rule of law around the globe. And quite frankly, I could speak from my perspective as the head of international law for the Department of Justice for over six years, is that this government is absolutely, the federal government is absolutely dedicated to promoting democratization, the rule of law, human rights, and good governance abroad. And it's not just out of a, it's not really out of a sense of altruism that this type of effort is being taken, but rather it's a very clear understanding that the gravest international dangers are rooted directly in the weakness of other countries such that structural debilities provide an opportunity for and give rise to these very basic human rights violations. Simply put, the lack of a viable governance structure provides a breeding ground for the disenfranchised to engage in lawless activities and enables a large segment of the population to foment hatred and enables and encourages gross violations of human rights, such as we have witnessed in fragile states such as Uganda. Second, let me turn to authoritarian regimes for a moment. And I, call it, I was trying to think the other day how to, how to characterize it. So for lack of a better term, I call it authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. So what can you say about a country that has a developed political system? So I'm moving away from failed and fragile states that really have no basic governance structures. And how do you then look upon a state that actually has a, a political system like Russia, albeit a political system not like ours? Well, here again, it is clear that the lack of proper adherence to basic human rights international norms in regards to a system of justice as a whole can doom other reforms to failure as well. Because again, here in such regimes, the absence of an independent judicial institution, the lack of an independent prosecution service provides an open invitation for those in power to take up corruption and violence as tools of power. So for example, if you follow my line of thinking, then you can understand when we witness governments passing laws criminalizing queer behavior, like walking down the street and holding a partner's hand, and it is likely sanctioned by gay bashing, then such repugnant acts actually serve the purposes of a corrupt government. The third area 
uh, of uh, global interest, of course, is in democracies. And it's curiosity to me that violations of human rights and LGBT rights happen in democracies. So despite the, my claim that most LGBT viol, human rights violations take place in failed and fragile states, and totalitarian system as well, it's clear that it happens in, in, in democratic systems, states as well. But very often it happens in Western style democracies that have pervasive and long-standing cultural and social norms that find homosexual behavior unacceptable. <laughs> Places in such island states in the Caribbean, such as Jamaica, and I know that Michael is gonna to talk to us today about the situation in Jamaica. I worked in Jamaica for about uh, three years. We have um, a program at the Department of Justice going on in Jamaica as well. And I remember one of our uh, colleagues who was down there, um, first of all, it's, it's, Kingston it, it has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And you certainly don't want to be seen very often, as Michael could probably attest to, um, walking around at night looking like you don't belong and certainly looking like you perhaps might be a member of the LGBT community, you ain't getting back to your hotel in good shape. And I actually called Jamaica one of the most shock shockingly virulent homophobic countries in the world. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what Michael has to say about that. And so in such places with long-standing histories of homophobic treatment, it is easy or easier to understand that while you can assert rights in democratic regimes, it's not always the case in places as I've just mentioned. Let me just spend a couple of minutes. I think we only have about 12 minutes. So I have about four more minutes or three more minutes? Roughly, Roughly speaking, fine, I'll take 10. Um, I'll just give you a couple, couple of personal examples of, of some of the situations that I encountered. Um, it was interesting. Let me tell you about some of my work in the Palestinian Authority. Remember, I'm a triple threat. Short, Jewish, and gay. Well, I have to tell you, it was a lot easier for me to be short. Well, that I had no choice. <laughs> but it's a lot easier to be short and Jewish in the Palestinian Authority than it is to be gay. And frankly, in my years working there, um, we actually, and most of you probably don't know this, but we actually have, uh, the Department of Justice actually established an office. There is the Canadian Department of Justice actually has an office on the ground floor of the Attorney General's office that we established in Ramallah. And we have a populated with staff from the Department of Justice in Canada. We've locally engaged people, and I have a staff, had a staff back at, in Ottawa that was shepherding this program. And what we were doing in the Palestinian Authority was we were actually established in the Attorney General's office and the Prosecution Service for the Palestinian Authority. And the aim of that in particular, our focus was to help them understand um, in trying to figure out how to get a proper functioning uh, prosecution service, one of the aims that we were looking at in particular were gender rights. Uh, we started with human rights. As you know, there's honor killings that are very uh, prevalent in a number of Muslim countries. And prosecutors are not, the ones that are, are just beginning their training in the PA, are not used to understanding in a, in a patriarchal, male-dominated society, don't really understand abuse against women. And so we're actually established establishing gender and human rights units in the Attorney General's Office and Prosecution Services across the Palestinian Authority. And so in my mind, the first line of defense is to get them human rights training, gender, um, a, a, a gender sensitivity training, and that will then lead to the next level uh, of human rights protections. But that's where we have to start. In Bangladesh, uh, we had a seven-year project. It was about a seven, the, the Palestinian Authority pro project is actually um, about a $20 million project over about six years. In Bangladesh, we had a $7 million project, and in particular, we not only established the Law Commission of Bangladesh, helped to uh, codify the laws of Bangladesh um, in, in Bengali, um, but we actually did activities in the human rights field, such as establishing an uh, acid victims survivor program and work with the um, prosecutors to understand how to deal with abuse against women again, you, know, you understand what acid 
victim survivors are, is women who have been violated um, for being perceived to have engaged in some sort of misbehavior by their partners or their husbands and throw acid in their faces or force them to drink acid. So we're trying to establish an acid victim survivor program. Here was my interesting comment. I was lecturing at the University of Dhaka, at the law school in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And it was an audience slightly bigger than this audience. It was a first or second year class, I don't recall. And I was giving uh, a presentation on, on basic promotion of human rights in Canada and the Constitution. And um, after my presentation, it was questions and, and answers. And I'll just take one more, two more minutes. And, and basically, questions and answers. And one of the students put up their hand and, and said, um, Professor Berlin, can you explain to me why is it that Canada protects gays and lesbians when clearly they're mentally insane? to which the entire class broke out in rapturous applause. <laughs> sort of, okay, now is not the time to assert my gayness. I figured that one out pretty quickly. And what struck me was that I then sort of deflected that question by talking about how pleased I was that he asked me such a question and how great was it that he was in a society where he was able to express his views and, and be open in, 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 in promoting his values. And I turned it into a discussion about expression of opinion and freedom of expression. How does one assert LGBT rights in a strongly Muslim country that equates gay as mentally insane? A huge challenge. And so, what we talk about, though, of course, was starting the initial onslaught by trying to gently get them to understand the notion of, of international norms of human rights uh, and, and how they might apply, and then you build the building blocks. Well, um, I can go on and talk about my experience in Sudan, which maybe I'll get a chance to talk about in the question and answers. Let me last leave you with this last minute uh, to talk about simply the fact that the role of the Canadian Bar Association and the Ontario Bar Association has to play. In areas such as that we're now perceiving in, in, in Russia, Uganda, Cameroons, countries that are actually passing international, uh, passing domestic legislation outline the, the, the actual physical manifestation of any gay behavior, walking on the street, holding a hand, holding a sign, uh, trying to uh, hold a, a, a parade, or even assert the fact that, that uh, homosexuality is a legitimate um, a, a, a characterization of an individual. That's outlawed. Well, what I'm extraordinarily proud about is that the Canadian Bar Association uh, lobbied very heavily uh, and immediately started getting in contact with members of parliament, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Prime Minister. And in each and every one of those situations, we'll talk about it later in question and answer, the Prime Minister, along with the Foreign Affairs Minister, John Baird, have strongly, in no uncertain terms, verbally and, and, and in written fashion condemn these actions in these states. And that's something that we have to be very proud about here in Canada as well in talking about how do we assert uh, LGBT rights internationally in places that are apparently uh, democratic. So there you go. Thanks for listening. I look forward to my panelists. Thank you. Thank you to Mark for that. Uh, now I'm going to call up on Lee Waldorf to come up here again very briefly. She is the Special Advisor with Women's Human Rights with the Stephen Lewis Foundation. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Am I positioned properly with the mic? Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, thanks to the Law Society for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, I've just come back to Toronto. This used to be my home after 15 years working at the United Nations in New York. Um, so I thought I'd take the opportunity, given that we're supposed to be talking about how international human rights law actually applies to the situation of LGBT people, to give you an overview of what's happening with international human rights law. <clears throat> And I will make my best effort not to make this tedious. If it becomes tedious at any point, someone yawn really demonstratively or something like that. But the actual story with international human rights is an exciting one. 
on the LGBT front. So I expect you won't suffer too hideously. Um, anyways, what, what I wanted to flag was that there is actually something to celebrate right now in terms of the international legal framework. Because in, within the last 10 years, we've seen a sea change from basically zero attention or such token trivial attention as to be almost insulting to a point where LGBT rights are now at the center of the human rights debate globally. Um, and it's important if, if you do international law because then you get to talk about it, but it's important ultimately because the only reason people bother to pay attention to international standards is because ultimately they think they can use them to influence change on the ground in their countries and we can see some of that happening. So it's a tremendously exciting period and it is Pride Week, we're supposed to be happy, so it's a happy subject, so there we go. Those are all my explanations for why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. Um, now to start off, to be clear, it's not, what I'm saying is not that LGBT people as the holders of human rights were born 10 years ago. That's absolutely not the case. With the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in, the, in 1948 when it was passed, it was very clear that all people were entitled to equality and non-discrimination. All people were the holders of all rights. It was not exclusionary in any fashion. The difficulty for a very, very long time was the appreciation or the perception or the action of people in power in relation to the legal standards. And it was the failure to recognize the existing legal entitlements that was a block for a very, very long time. Um, page two starts talking about how that happened. So we'll go there. Um, <clears throat> okay. So when you're looking, the first thing you think about when you think about international human rights are the treaties themselves, the, these legally binding agreements that governments have, have signed on to. And in the period of time when both, most of them were being drafted and negotiated, we're talking 60s, 70s, and in some part 80s, the notion that you would get an intergovernmental agreement, which is what generates a treaty, that you would get you know, Zambia and Ethiopia and Pakistan to agree to the text of something that would include an explicit reference to LGBT rights would be just lunacy. You might as well believe in unicorns. <clears throat> so the difficulty we first stated, we first encountered was that the text, the text of the human rights treaties that everybody was using to frame the debate never said anything about LGBT people. Although, you know, the, the space was left open. Very often, I think in the, the civil and political covenant, the economic and social covenant, there's reference to other status, which means some very smart little bunnies were making sure that there was a, an opening there and, and space made ready for the time that you could deal because the situation had changed. And then following through the 80s and 90s into the, I don't know what the heck you call the zeros, um, there was a social sh shift, enough of a social shift around the world that space has opened up. And so what we saw was a, a period where we had incremental, very under the radar, very strategic little bits of changes. You saw LGBT groups actually looking at, you, at uh, international fora and say, you know, I could probably get myself in there. I could probably make my case. I could probably try to make an argument. And on the other side of it, in the various treaty bodies with special rapporteurs, you saw some very progressive, brave individuals who were saying, you know, if somebody ever actually raised this question with me, I might be willing to say something about it. Um, you see, you have about a 10 year period where bits and pieces of comments were coming out here and there. Um, individual people were doing something. It was happening gradually. And then there was some kind of critical mass that was struck about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, everything shifted. And we went from a situation where there were random bits and pieces of maybe something said about a lesbian here, or actually usually not a lesbian, usually a homosexual man, we know that, but um, uh, to the point where it became the norm and the expectation that the international human rights system would systematically comment. If a special rapporteur went into a country, if a treaty body was reviewing the performance of a government, they would systematically look at this issue and systematically raise the concerns. So what we have right now, and this is really within the last 10 years, a really significant body of jurisprudence and, and precedent that recognizes the rights of LGBT people and is also recognizing a whole series of major human rights violations and bringing international attention to them. And I'll just give you a run through. I won't get into the details because they're actually somewhat depressing to tell you the truth. But <laughs> these are, this is it. First of all, murder. Ma murder by agents of the state and murders by private actors. And this also includes the issue of honor killings to which lesbians are more subject, in which you're really dealing with family and communities perpetrating things for, perpetrating murder to the state to obtain, uphold community values and uh, family integrity, a whole range of physical assaults. 
and within this, the phenomenon of so-called corrective rape of lesbians, within the assumption that this will somehow transform their uh, gender identity and their sexual orientation. Um, also at the level of what the state's doing, the refusal to grant asylum and to recognize that there is, in fact, a reasonable basis of fear of suffering and persecution on return. Uh, that's, that was uh, pretty um, standard torture and ill treatment in prison horrible, horrible documentation. Fortunately, extensive documentation instead of none now, but horrible stories coming out of that. Um, criminal, the criminalization of same-sex activity, which unfortunately is on the rise rather than, um, rather than the opposite, including in some cases, I think in about five countries right now, criminal codes that impose the death penalty. Um, failure to provide legal protections to LGBT persons in the forms of in their inclusion in anti-discrimination uh, provisions and clauses. <clears throat> Refusal of the state to actually exer um, assert uh, equality rights in the context of family law regimes, uh, employment, health care, uh, refusal to recognize same-sex relationships, and finally, a whole range of prohibitions, and we're seeing more and more of this, on the organizing of LGBT people and freedom of association, freedom of speech, um, holding gay pride events, that simple that sort of stuff getting outlaw. And to get, make that a little more concrete, and um, I'll just give you the example with one committee, which I'm very familiar with, the CEDAW committee. Um, they're, they're responsible for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, they're probably one of the most ratified treaties in the world, one of the treaty bodies that uh, hears most from governments. They're busy, busy, busy. Ten years ago, they said, didn't say boo. And this, despite the fact through personal, well, not quite so intimate experience, but personal knowledge, a lot of people on the committee were lesbians. But it was simply not this, the thing to be dealt with in, in the human rights world. But in the very last couple of years, they've become extremely active. Um, just last two years, Russia, Korea, Macedonia, and Zimbabwe, they've been pushing them to change, adopt anti-discrimination le legislation, start up public awareness campaigns, train the police. They've gone after Costa Rica, Albania, and Singapore to implement their non-discrimination legislation, which apparently they, they're not doing much about. They've gone after Uganda, asking for them to decriminalize homosexual behavior, to um, bring through effective legal protections, and to oppose a private member's bill that has been tabled and been floating around for some time that, again, would ha impose harsh criminal penalties. They've commended South Africa for its brilliant legal architecture. As we all know, South Africa actually has sexual orientation and the protection of, of the equal, equality rights of LGBT people in the Constitution. Unfortunately, at the level of reality, there's not the political will and the commitment to realize that. So there's a high level of violence against LGBT people. And in fact, the incidence of uh, corrective rape might be highest in South Africa of any country on, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the government isn't doing what it needs to do behind that. Similarly, they've gone after Norway about their inability to deal with LGBT asylum seekers and so on. Um, so the human rights world, and this is the human rights independent expert world, the world of, of policy and law, has come fully on board. The interesting thing that I think makes, makes it mean that we've got a shift that we're dealing with now, which means we have to change how we think, is this has now gone back to the intergovernmental level. In 2011, the Human Rights Council for the first time passed a resolution recognizing the rights of LGBT people. Now this is something of a complete category difference from the treaty bodies as special rapporteurs. This is an intergovernmental forum. If you remember, as I was saying earlier, when the treaty, treaties were being negotiated, there was no hope in the 60s and 70s of getting governments to agree that LGBT people had rights. 2011, the Human Rights Council, composed of 53 or whatever governments, agreed, and they passed a resolution. Um, now this is fantastic, and, uh, but it also means strategically we're at a different place. Because for the last 20 years we've been under the radar, talking to friends and looking for strategic entry points to get the recognition of rights. This has now come up to the most public stage. This is now being debated between governments, and it's a wonderful opportunity because of the, the chance to actually cement the achievements and the gains for LGBT people, but a public war can be publicly lost as well. And there's no certainty in the current political climate that the intergovernmental debates in the Human Rights Council and elsewhere are going to fall in our favor. And in fact, just two weeks ago, there was hope to get another resolution passed in the Human Rights Council. There wasn't enough support. They just had a joint statement from government. So we have to watch that. Um, how am I doing on time? I talk very quickly. I don't know if that helps any. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Two minutes, 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 two minutes,
that uh, the LGBT community is here and it needs support. La democracia no es ni de derecha, ni de izquierda, ni de centro. La democracia es democracia con derechos igualitarios. The democracy is not from left or right, it's just a straight to help everybody with the lo, human rights. Lo que estamos pidiendo la comunidad LGBT son derechos igualitarios. What no we are asking, otros derechos. What we are asking the, uh, the LGBT community is uh, human rights, no other rights. La ley de identidad de género en Canadá lo que va a hacer es que la comunidad trans pueda acceder a todos los beneficios. The gender identity law, what it means is that the LGBT community can uh, access all the rights. Lo logramos en un país subdesarrollado como Argentina. We achieved this in a third uh, country as uh, is Argentina. Así que Canadá tiene toda la oportunidad de realmente lograr más derechos para la comunidad LGBT. Then seeing this, um, we think that Canada has to do the same thing and even more. Hay buenas prácticas en el sur de Latinoamérica. There is a lot of good practices in South America. Estos son momentos políticos en la en la cual hay que aprovecharlos. This is a, the political momento that we have to uh, to take advantage of. Hay que visibilizarnos, hay que manifestarnos y hay que reclamar. We have to visualize, we have to achieve we have to, to get in there. La comunidad LGBT no queremos más tolerancia, queremos derechos humanos. We don't want more tolerance, we want human rights. No queremos más impunidad. We don't want more impunity. Hay una epidemia que está avanzando sobre nuestra comunidad que es el VIH SIDA. There is an epidemic that is uh, getting uh, over us. It's the VIH, VIH, HID. Necesitamos que el Estado invierta en disminuir el estigma y la discriminación. And we need the government to get over the stigma and the discrimination. No queremos ser más las olvidadas y los olvidados de la democracia. We don't want to be the forgotten of the democracy anymore. Es necesario que salga la ley de identidad de género en Canadá. It's uh, necessary that the identity gender law just um, be passed from the government. Sin patologización, sin disforia de género y sin tener que pasar por un psiquiatra para reconocer nuestra identidad. With any assessment from the psychiatrist or a doctor or pathology uh, that is needed. We don't, we don't want that. La ley de identidad de género en Argentina es un trámite administrativo. The gender identity law is just an administrative uh, proceeding. Yo decido de mi cuerpo y yo decido de mi vida. I decide about my body and about my life. El Estado lo que tiene que hacer es acompañar esa construcción femenina o masculina desde la niñez y la adolescencia. The, the government has to just be a partner uh, to us to build this uh, identity uh, from our uh, childhood and adolescence. No podemos permitir que sigan diciendo que somos personas enfermas. 
we don't want, we cannot allow everybody to say that we are a sick people. Que somos personas peligrosas. That we are uh, like criminals. Porque somos parte de esta sociedad y vivimos en esta sociedad y construimos este bello país. Because we are part of the society. We are people that are constructing and are helping to construct this, this world. Y la democracia se construye con más derechos. And the democracy is built up with more rights. Hay que trabajar en conjunto el activismo y la sociedad. We have to work together, the activists and the society. Porque hay muchos compañeros y compañeras que en este momento se están muriendo en las salas de los hospitales. Because there is a lot of people, our people, that they are dying in the hospitals. Que no tienen un apoyo. That they don't have any support. Donde solamente lo que recibieron fue exclusión social. They just were excluded, totally. Y atrás de muchas de nosotras y nosotros hay mucha gente que necesita tener una mejor calidad de vida. And behind us, there is a lot of us, of people who want to have a very good life, a quality of life. No, no permitamos que la justicia sea una justicia solamente para unos y para otros. Don't allow the justice to be just for ones and not for another's. La justicia tiene que ser para todos y todas igualitarias. The justice has to be equal for everybody. No podemos seguir siendo ciudadanos y ciudadanas de segunda y de tercera. We, we cannot continue being uh, citizens, uh, second hand or third hand citizens. Las leyes a favor de la comunidad LGBTIQ de Canadá tienen que salir del closet del Parlamento Nacional. The laws for uh, the LGBT community has to uh, get out from the closet of the government of Canada. Porque son nuestras leyes, son nuestros derechos y la sociedad tiene que saber. Because they are our rights and the society has to know. Que también tenemos familia, que también somos madres, que también somos padres, que somos hijos. That we have families, we have parents, we have children. Y que este es el momento en la cual la comunidad trans del Canadá está exigiendo la igualdad de derechos. And this is the time that the community trans has, uh, is asking for the rights. No queremos ser más humilladas. We don't want to be more humiliated. Queremos el reconocimiento a nuestra identidad de género. We want to be recognized for our gender. Porque somos parte de esta sociedad y vivimos en esta sociedad. Because we are part of this society and we live in this society. Solamente lo que reclamamos son derechos humanos, yeah. los derechos universales. The only thing that we are claiming is the human rights. Sin derechos humanos no existe una democracia real. With no human rights, there is no a real society. Para la comunidad LGBTIQ de Canadá. For the community of uh, the LGBT community and the Q community. Eh, simplemente decirles que lamento que no hablo inglés. I'm really sorry because I don't speak English. Tengo muchas cosas para decir. I Tengo, have a lot of things to say. Pero no, no hablo inglés, pero sé que lo que nos une es la lucha, la discriminación y la violencia de género que recibimos día a día las mujeres trans. 
Um, I don't speak English, but the thing that uh, unites us is the fight against the violence uh, against us, against the LGBT community. Y agradecerles por estar aquí presente. And I want to say thank you because of your presence here. Y como siempre digo, en la región de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. And as I said, every, uh, every time in South America and in the Caribbean. Vamos por más. We are going for more. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And that was, and that was perfectly done to time, actually. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, from Marcella, let us now go to Michael Charles, uh, lawyer, management consultant, and principal of Change Design Consulting. So uh, just to thank uh, Rudy and Adrian, I think, of the OBA for planning this important and timely discussion. Um, your leadership is critical. I think these kinds of person-to-person -person engagements are precisely the kind of thing that we need to catalyze change as we start to take this movement worldwide. Uh, so you know, in my day-to-day -day job uh, as a management consultant, now former practicing lawyer, I do a certain amount of public speaking, uh, and, uh, but uh, actually I don't often get to speak on behalf of Human Rights Watch um, in my capacity as a member of the Canada Committee there. Uh, and uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about the type of work that we are doing to advocate for LGBT rights in the Caribbean and particularly in uh, Jamaica. So unlike my fellow uh, panelists who are experts in this field of, of human rights, uh, I sort of sit here as a more in a volunteer capacity, uh, but hopefully you can, those of you who are not sort of actively engaged in the, uh, the rights efforts can see yourselves through me. I can be a bridge for you uh, so that you can see that in small ways and large, you can begin to take on the issues for yourself and uh, enact change within your own particular spheres. So before I, develop, I delve, uh, sorry, sorry, delve into the pages I've prepared um, around the work that HRW is doing in Jamaica, I just wanted to answer a couple of sort of preliminary questions. And that the first is, of course, you know, what are we talking about when we refer to the Caribbean? Um, is it a geographic region? Is it a political uh, category? And of course, it's both. But for purposes of this discussion, I'm going to refer to the Commonwealth Caribbean, which is a series of 14 English-speaking independent nation states. Um, and uh, I will work with that definition uh, throughout these uh, hopefully brief remarks. Um, secondly, uh, I think the important question that arises from time to time is, you know, why should we care uh, really about LGBT rights in the Caribbean? I mean, isn't the Caribbean just a place that we think about when we want to sort of retreat from the frozen temperatures of February and want a little bit of a respite? Uh, but I'm going to make the case uh, that, of course, uh, the Caribbean is uh, much closer to us than we think. If we uh, consider alone our outbound foreign direct investment. After the US and Europe, the Caribbean is the largest recipient of, of outbound uh, foreign direct investment in the world. It's larger than all that we invest in India, larger than all that we invest in China, the balance of Asia, all of South America combined. And that investment is growing. If you look at the DFATE website, it's now at about $66.5 billion. That's up 10% from the previous year. And so if we look at um, the commercial uh, relationship, it is extremely close and the Caribbean is not remote. We also should consider the people relationships between uh, Canada and the Caribbean. There are um, the last uh, solid stats we have, uh, actually as far back as 2001, are that there are 500,000 members of the diaspora, of which I count myself as one, uh, living here between uh, Ontario and Quebec. And the overwhelming majority of those are in Ontario. So if we consider the uh, connections between Canada and the region, and both in terms of the flow of peoples and in terms of commerce, 
uh, the relationship is extremely complex, and it is appropriate, I think, to be able to ask ourselves what are the similarities and differences between respective human rights regimes as they relate to LGBT people, given that proximity, and begin to ask these questions not just based on um, value uh, types of arguments or, or discussions around Canadian values, but also ask these questions in terms of legal analysis and through the lens of self-interest, again, given our proximity. So for the balance of the, my remarks, I then want to sort of introduce three features of what I see as the LGBT uh, rights struggle in, in Jamaica uh, and, um, and talk a bit about the work that HRW has done there. Uh, the three features are as follows. Uh, one is what I'm calling an institutional consensus of discrimination, institutional consensus of discrimination. And I'm going to use a narrative of risk to begin to try and convey that idea. Secondly, I want to refer to two cases that are uh, pending uh, in, the, in the Caribbean, actually in relation to Jamaica uh, now, uh, and uh, use them as a means of exposing the limitations on uh, legal interventions as instruments as, of change. Using that as a setup, then I want to thirdly talk about other complementary forms of advocacy in order to advance LGBT rights. So turning first to this idea of uh, the institutional consensus of discrimination, I want to tell you a story about um, two folks named Althea and Reginald. Um, usually when we talk about you know, the, the data as it relates to uh, LGBT uh, rights abuses, we kind of resort to this um, cloud of data that often seems to fragment and segment human experience. And I'm going to prefer this time to actually go down on a granular, granular level and speak about sort of two folks, Althea and Reginald, because I think you can see the fragmented data over a continuum of experience more clearly. So to be absolutely um, unambiguous, uh, these are not the real names of these witnesses. They've been redacted from the data. Uh, but Althea and Reginald are, gonna rep are going to be representations, uh, but all of the, rep all the situations, I should say, um, that I'm going to describe are taken from the actual research that HRW has done, as well as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from the period 2003 to 2012. So all of these situations are, in fact, taken from the research. So let's start uh, in year 2005. Althea is a 25-year-old woman and a reluctant lesbian. I say reluctant because she grew up in a close-knit family uh, to whom or for whom the Christian church was an ordering influence as well as um, and remains uh, explicit in its condemnation of homosexuality. Uh, she lives in Jamaica, a country which has criminalized homosexual conduct, punishable uh, by a term of imprisonment for up to 10 years since the colonial period. And uh, it should be said that Jamaica, unlike all other Commonwealth uh, Caribbean countries, uh, continues uh, with the possible and qualified exception of the Bahamas, and I can talk about that hopefully in our question and answer period, uh, but all of these Commonwealth countries continue to criminalize homosexual conduct. So at the age of uh, 17, Althea was discovered in her neighborhood in the embrace of a woman um, who she calls uh, simply a good friend, uh, her father confronted her, asked her to leave, and she has had minimal contact with her family since then. Althea was compelled to leave school following assaults and threats from her classmates, and her principal offered her no assistance on the basis that her behavior was both criminal and sinful and left him, therefore, no recourse. Uh, her friend, Reginald, whom she has known since childhood, um, has sex with men, but he does not refer to himself as gay. Uh, and he regrettably has contracted HIV, and he is not managing his disease well for two principal reasons. One, um, once his doctor diagnosed him, he was excluded from his clinic. And secondly, when he saw treatment at a specialized uh, HIV clinic, he soon realized that there were locals lying in wait outside the entrance uh, as patients exited, and he no longer felt safe. So he is no, he's not seeking any treatment for his uh, disease, and he is deteriorating. So Althea, of course, looking at the condition of her friend, is falling into a depression, but tries to keep things into perspective, knowing that as a woman, she is not susceptible to the disease. Of course, she is entirely wrong. The Caribbean is the only region, aside from sub-Saharan Africa, where poor proportion of women and girls uh, who are living with uh, the infection is higher than that of men and boys. 
and HIV prevalence in the Caribbean is uh, higher than in any other region in the world, generally speaking, outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. And it is the leading cause of death among people aged 20 to 59 years of age. So back to our narrative. In around 2007, Reginald was, of course, killed by machete. The police attended at the scene upon learning that um, he was uh, gay or being told that he was gay, they decided not to investigate. 150 people attended Reginald's funeral in a church where he had worshipped. And during the final hymn, a mob broke uh, through the church doors and attacked the mourners. Police again arrived at the scene, um, but instead of intervening to stop the violence, proceeded to socialize with the mob members as others uh, continued with their rampage. So later that, um, or after that day, I should say, well after that day, Althea defiantly continues to walk past the church where Reginald's funeral was so rudely interrupted. Uh, and one day she was followed by a group of men who uh, continued to call after her, demanding to know uh, where, were, where, where pardon me, her husband was. And that was the last thing that she remembers before being revived in hospital a, a day later with a particular and excruciating uh, type of pain. So to ascend back to the uh, heights of the data cloud for a moment, the mob attack on the church that I described was reproduced almost verbatim from a 2012 report by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. That mob attack took place on April the 8th, 2007, a year in which there were an additional 43 mob attacks against uh, gays and lesbians over a period of uh, six months. So the narrative of risk that I have described is an attempt to show the institutional consensus of discrimination in, in Jamaica, along cultural, along uh, religious, along legal, along educational, along health, and in the political sphere as well. And all of these elements weave together in an environment that is deeply hazardous for the LGBT community. So what is being done? In terms of legal interventions, there are two cases that I want to talk about. One is actually being heard today called um, Jagai, if I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, at the Supreme Court in Jamaica. And the second is a pending case being heard, uh, or to be heard, at the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights in the name of two petitioners whose names have been uh, sealed. So to talk first about Jagai, the domestic case, I have to take you back in terms of a little bit of legislative history and talk about the Offenses Against the Persons Act, which is the originating legislation in which all of these buggery laws, which they are actually called, um, first were established. And this is, of course, the colonial era uh, statute um, that, um, was, uh, that came into force in uh, 1864. So, uh, fast forward now to the moment of independence in 1962 and the constitution that was enacted uh, does something actually that's quite unique in the world as confirmed for me by, uh, by Lee. It actually insulates, insulates from judicial review um, the right of the courts to uh, scrutinize the offenses against the Persons Act and the sexual offenses that are ca contained within it. Okay, fine, so that's at the point of independence that that took place. What's happened since? Well, in 2011, uh, Jamaica adopted what is called the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, which again repeated the process of statutory uh, insulation and prohibits judges from reviewing um, the sexual offenses contained in the Offenses Against the Persons Act. So Jagai has brought this case uh, before the court saying that the anti-sodomy laws, or the buggery laws, uh, breach the right of privacy that has now been established in their brand new charter. And um, unfortunately, um, in the, as I said, that case is being heard uh, today, maybe has just concluded. Um, but uh, the prospects are not good for, uh, and I'll tell you why, uh, in two ways. Uh, first, the prospect of the court striking out all are part of a statute that has been constitutionally reinscribed in two separate constitutional processes in favor of a new right to privacy, privacy as it relates to LGBT persons is quite remote. Uh, secondly, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Jamaican PMO's office announced that Parliament was going to hold a conscious vote to debate the buggery laws. Um, uh, it's not clear to me what the effect of that particular debate is going to be, uh, but uh, given that um, it is now a political question, um, it's 
probably, or at least one could reasonably suspect that the court uh, is going to be inclined to stay the proceedings that they have just uh, heard or reserve opinion, at least in, uh, now that the that Parliament has occupied this space. So that case doesn't look good. Uh, the second matter, though, which is uh, at a multi uh, inst multilateral institutional level, is the is the case before the Inter American Court on on Human Rights. Uh, that um, sorry, Commission on Human Rights. That commission was established by the OAS Charter in 1948, and Jamaica is subject. Uh, to it as a member. Uh, and this claim is being brought by two petitioners uh, alleging that Jamaica's anti-sodomy laws violate various provisions of the, uh, what is called the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Um, I think that it is quite likely that the Commission is going to find against Jamaica and recommend that uh, the uh, laws criminalizing um, homosexual conduct uh, be abandoned, but I think our enthusiasm should be contained. Uh, first of all, the Commission's powers are advisory, they are not binding. Uh, secondly, it's not clear when the Commission will be able to report. That claim was commenced in 2011. Jamaica has yet to respond, and it has the right to do so, and it may just continue to rag the puck. Uh, good old Canadian expression. Um, for years, and we don't see an end in sight. Uh, and thirdly, of course, there's the risk that uh, J uh, Jamaica may never respond uh, to that particular petition, and that puts the, the IACHR in a really awkward position of attempting to re uh, release a report to which a state party has not actually made formal answer. What, did that, what does that say about the weight that should be afforded or accorded to that particular uh, decision in the absence of a response. And uh, so there becomes a question of the credibility of the institution itself if it proceeds to do that. So the legal interventions, and these are the only two at the moment, um, uh, as it relates to Jamaica, have limited uh, reach and scope and uh, should be considered along with other tools, which I'm going to suggest to you now. And uh, and the uh, time is running. Okay, so I'll be very short. So um, uh, I think first and foremost, the uh, avenue of developing the metrics and the strategic non-legal advocacy is going to be key for Jamaica. Uh, so in this uh, uh, way, uh, of course, HRW's work in research um, cannot be underestimated. Um, our 2004 report that we that is online now. Um, has had a tremendous uh, impact in terms of rallying international support, providing better evidence for international institutions, and supporting local NGOs on the ground. And our second report, um, which is going to be just about 10 years after the first one uh, was produced, is coming out in the fall of this year, so stay tuned for that. I think there's also then, as a last comment, um, a role for Canadians to play it. So I began my comments by talking about the connections between Canada and the region that are both financial and, and human. Uh, $66.5 billion is a significant footprint in the region and should be leveraged. In particular, I think we should be asking ourselves uh, whether or not Canadians' uh, businesses that, are, uh, that have subsidiaries in the Caribbean are uh, implementing in a consistent way the human rights and diversity policies that they have here in the region. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine who's actually working on the, the uh, case before the, the commission told me that actually some kind of effort has been initiated in Jamaica where the subsidiaries have been asked, you know, can you implement the policies that you have in Canada in terms of non-discrimination and, and diversity uh, in the Caribbean? He was rebuffed on the basis that, you no, know, we have to respect local laws and culture. I think that argument is going to die. I think that, that uh, it, it, a slow death, but it will surely die. And we've seen that example already in the case of Bangladesh, most recently with respect to um, the, the Canadian clothing retailers, who, while they were not liable or responsible for the building collapse at the Rana Plaza that killed 1,100 people, the public outrage, the widespread media coverage, and the consumer ambivalence about the human price of low-cost products here in Canada has urged those retailers to act. And so the critical points here that I will leave you with are uh, that the standard of corporate responsibility is higher than the legal standard. Secondly, the public is prepared, and by that I mean the Canadian public, I think, is coming and is prepared to punish poor corporate performance wherever it occurs 
uh, through advocacy here at home, and that finally, advocacy in the foreign jurisdiction where uh, corporate underperformance conveniently allies with or aligns with offending local laws is a less effective response. So as we consider the ways in which Canadians can engage this issue, I ask you to consider um, our, our, our corporate um, uh, engagement in the Caribbean in particular. And I look forward to hearing what the rest of the panel has to say. Thank you. I just had to tease Michael about his time, <laughs> but it was very engaging. Uh, <laughs> now, we have one last Michael here, Michael Batista, who I'll call quickly up here. Uh, he's, an, he's an old friend. I think he's great. That's my introduction. <laughs> so there's Michael Batista. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So I've been asked to address the uh, domestic context, and um, I just wanted to start off with a bit of, hmm, what was that? Um, groundbreaking kind of breaking news domestic uh, piece of news here on LGBT rights courtesy of my law partner Kelly Jordan who's here and courtesy of course of my friend Martha McCarthy you may recall about a year year and a half ago um, there was this controversy that erupted in Canada due to the inability of non-resident same-sex couples to marry here do you recall that news story it was mostly Americans that came here to get married because they couldn't get married in their own states and then they found that they couldn't get divorced here or in their own states because they didn't meet the residency requirements. Well, Kelly just informed me a few minutes ago that uh, the House of Commons amended the Divorce Act to allow non-resident uh, spouses to marry. So thanks to Martha, as usual, for your wonderful advocacy on this and other issues. Okay, so... Um, the benefit of uh, going last and speaking last is that I get the kind of energy and the collective wisdom of the panel. The, the downside of it is that I really risk losing you because it's been a lot of information that's been thrown at you this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, and what I want to talk about is the application of international LGBT human rights law really in the domestic context. And I teach a course at U of T, the immigration law course, and I always start off the course by telling my students that, according to me, um, I really think that refugee law, asylum law, is applied human rights law, when you think about it. It's, it's where those human rights are enforced. They're enforced at the domestic level through our asylum system. And, you know, the asylum system can provide some very practical and effective remedies to human rights violations because it offers protection to the people who are, whose rights are being violated. But when we look at that application of those rights in the domestic Canadian context recently, uh, we've seen some really troubling changes in our, in our refugee proceedings that have, I think, really compromised the ability of LGBT people worldwide at risk to seek protection in our own borders. And I don't think it's so much a deliberate attack on LGBT refugees specifically. I think it's just more a lack of consciousness, a lack of uh, attention, a, a lack of awareness of the unique situation of LGBT refugees. So I just want to talk briefly about three changes that I think have a detrimental impact on LGBT refugees. And those changes are, number one, the shortened timelines for processing refugee claims. Secondly, I want to talk about this concept of safe countries, which are called designated countries of origin, uh, which is a very new concept in Canadian law. And then thirdly, I want to talk about visa restrictions, which actually act as impediments to people coming here and seeking safety. So I'll start with the shortened timelines. And, and I'll say right you know, off, off the top that generally speaking, speedy refugee processes are really good things for refugees. I mean, refugees are typically very traumatized by their experience of upheaval and persecution in their countries. And uh, anything that minimizes that kind of limbo and uncertainty is a very good thing. Previously in Canada, the wait for, from the time that you make a claim until a refugee hearing was about a year, a year and a half, sometimes it stretched on to two years. And I think everybody recognized that that was unacceptable. So to its credit, the government has uh, introduced initiatives that have re reduced that processing time. 
Um, but I think there's a tipping point at which the process becomes so fast that it actually compromises procedural rights. So generally speaking now, the processing time from the time that somebody arrives in Canada and makes a claim until the time of their hearing is 60 days. 60 days, two months. Uh, and during that time, they have to settle in, they have to find counsel, retain counsel, they have to file a lengthy document that explains the, the basis of their fears, and then they have to get started collecting evidence and preparing for their case. So it's a huge, huge task for refugees gen generally. But I think given the unique situation of LGBT uh, refugees, I mean, in my experience, LGBT refugees need extra time. And they need extra time because I think LGBT refugees have a more difficult time settling, integrating into the community. They don't usually have the support of their biological family members or, or members of the commu their community of nationality. And one of the critical ways of establishing someone's sexual orientation before a decision maker is to actually show that you have the support or you have roots in the local LGBT community. You've either participated in, L in LGBT organizations, you formed friendships or relationships uh, with local LGBT um, community members, and that takes time. And that, that takes certainly more than 60 days. And this is all aside from getting medical reports, police reports, all of that. So I think that there's a real concern with the process speeding up in a way that will really compromise LGBT rights. The second thing that I want to talk about is this concept of safe countries, which is very new to Canadian law. It was introduced in December of 2012. And the minister introduced this concept of the designated countries of origin. And this is really a list that's now 37 countries of countries that the minister deems to be safe, basically. And refugees who are citizens of these countries will be sped through the system at lightning speed. So they, they're hearing, remember I talked about 60 days for most claimants from the time of making the claim to the time of the hearing. These claimants will have their hearing within 30 to 45 days of making their claim. And they will be denied appeal rights. They are denied appeal rights. They don't have any right to work or to access health care while they're here uh, during the process. And I think what's most troubling is that the minister can really add countries to this list at the stroke of a pen. Previous incarnations of this proposal in the minority government had the, the minister actually consulting human rights organizations, but once the majority of government was achieved, that was taken right out. And the problem with this concept for LGBT refugees is that, as we know, a country can be generally safe for most people, but not safe at all for LGBT refugees. Um, examples uh, on the list. Um, Mexico is, is a country who's on the list. And despite formal um, advances in, in uh, in law and the situation for the situation of LGBT people in Mexico, it's still very dangerous in Mexico for many members of the LGBT community. Also on the list are countries like Cyprus and Croatia. And if you consult any human rights reports, um, such as the US Department of State report on human rights, you'll see that there are very well documented incidents of homophobic violence in these countries. Previously, the minister could, again, under the uh, minority government situation, the proposal that was put forward is that the minister had the power to exempt certain communities from the application, uh, the harsh application of this list. So, for example, the LGBT community in, in a certain country could be exempted. But then, again, once the, the uh, majority government was achieved, that, that, exempt, that right to, to, or power to exempt a certain community was taken out. So the fear now is that the minister will look at a country that's generally safe. I mean, I think most people um, who aren't familiar with LGBT rights in Jamaica would say Jamaica's a vacation paradise. There's, there's some violence, gun violence, but uh, the, uh, you know, generally a safe country. The fear is that without regard to the LGBT community, the minister will designate a country like Jamaica, um, and that will greatly prejudice, prejudice the people um, who need safety. Um, in the LGBT community uh, from Jamaica. And then uh, lastly, I want to talk about the imposition of visas. So visas are really primarily a way that governments have to stop people from coming here who they think are going to overstay their status 
or claim refugee status. And um, visas will be refused if it's suspected that somebody will make an asylum claim. In December 2012, the government imposed visas against St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Namibia, Botswana, and Swaziland. All of these countries have um, laws criminalizing homosexuality. The reason the minister gave for uh, imposing visas, and this is from the press release, there's an unacceptably high number of asylum claims from these countries. And I know from my practice that the majority of people who were making claims were members of the LGBT community. Most of these people won't even make it here now. So that brings me to my last point, um, and this is a bit of a plug, <laughs> but I wanted to also end on, on an optimistic note. Um, I've been involved for eight years now with a, an organization that I'm very proud of called Rainbow Railroad. And to my knowledge, it's really a very unique organization internationally. It's dedicated to assisting LGBT uh, people at risk in their own country make it to points of safety. And that point of safety could be Canada, it could be another country. Um, we're basically the link between that country of persecution, that railroad, to a point of safety anywhere. We're sort of like the UNHCR, except without the politics and without the bureaucracy. <laughs> Um, so we, we've focused right now, I mean, we're a small group and we focused right now where this, our connections are strongest, and that's really Jamaica. And we've been very effective, I'm proud to say, in uh, helping get a lot of LGBT Jamaicans to safety. Um, and uh, the situation in, in Jamaica is deteriorating, and it's deteriorating because of this backlash that's happening as people are pushing the laws, challenging the bu buggery laws. There's actually a backlash from the community that's making the situation worse. Um, and while we focus on Jamaica, really, I receive pleas for help from countries like Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, Uganda, Uzbekistan. I have to say that, you know, when I open up my outlook every week, there's like two or three messages from um, somebody who, who really needs our help, and we're not able to help everybody, certainly. I said we were a bit like UNHCR. The other similarity with UNHCR is that we desperately need funds, and this is where the plug comes in. <laughs> Um, the requests that we receive are really so high in number that we could actually hire a staff person. But we haven't been able to do that because all of the funds have been allocated toward actually helping people get out of their countries and make it to points of safety. Um, that's our first priority, helping people in need. So I wanted to let you all know that if you are interested in helping us out in any way, there will be a table set up at the reception later and uh, we're happy to receive any support and assistance. Um, financial or otherwise that you can, uh, that you can think of um, or that you're able to, uh, to give us. We're also open to your ideas and your energy. So please, if you can't manage the funds, please approach us with, uh, with any commitments you can make in terms of time and ideas. So these methods that I talked about, you know, both the asylum system and organizations like Rainbow Railroad, they really are not ideal. The ideal is to really get better mechanisms to protect international LGBT uh, human rights at that international level. In, in some ways, the asylum system and organizations like Rainbow Railroad are really, they're really signs of the failure of the international um, protection network for LGBT people at risk. But really, until the international human rights regime is strong enough to effectively enforce LGBT rights, these kinds of mechanisms are, are all we have, and I think that it's very important that we make them as strong as possible. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, that you may have and that we have time for. Thanks. Stay in the chair. There we go. We can stay in the chairs. It's like Oprah. <laughs> okay. So let's open this up. Uh, we uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone who's been sitting in and through the patients uh, uh, through all our speakers. But hopefully you found it uh, interesting. Uh, we want to remind you that the uh, next 15, 20 minutes or so, it's going to be uh, dedicated to you to ask your questions of any one of these panelists uh, to uh, jump off any point they may have made or ask a uh, 
whole different question, but we do ask that you make your way to a microphone. Uh, the, everything uh, that will be said here is going to be recorded so they can be played back on the internet. Um, so feel free to make your way to the microphone. Uh, oh, so we'll begin to my left. Yes, uh, Michael F. Charles. Yes, could you tell me something about the Bahamas, please? Oh, uh, is there a mic? Is yeah. my mic on? Yeah, there you go. What in particular would you like to know about the Bahamas? <laughs> well, you said maybe somebody would ask you something oh. about it in the question <laughs> period, so I'm just being courteous. So, so Bahamas is the only English-speaking uh, Caribbean island, the Commonwealth Caribbean island, that does not criminalize uh, private homosexual conduct. And so that's why I said it, it actually was the only one that didn't um, criminalize uh, homosexual conduct. And I said that in a very qualified way because public acts are still criminalized, but not heterosexual public acts, but only homosexual public acts. So the discrimination is still ingrained within the law. It is, uh, it is just uh, the private acts are, are protected. So that's the, the distinction there. Um, but uh, there are similar problems. I mean, I, I, we focus on Jamaica because that's where uh, most of the uh, HRW work has been done. There's a political opportunity that has been presented right now because uh, current uh, Prime Minister um, Simpson Miller uh, is the first Caribbean leader to actually come out and say that uh, uh, discrimination against um, on the, or on the basis of sexual identity or, or gender identity uh, should be prohibited. She's the first one to do it. So there's a political opportunity there that should be supported. Uh, and also because of Jamaica's relative size, outsized influence, um, both geographic and, and commercial in the Caribbean is so uh, important, uh, HRW has focused its energies there. But uh, I don't want that to be left out there somehow that other Caribbean countries in the Commonwealth are not going through similar kinds of, of wrenching problems because uh, they do uh, also occur in those other places as well. Uh, thank, thank you. My question is for Mark. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear myself. Okay, good. Uh, Mark, my question is about Canada's new Office of Religious Freedom. Uh, and the, the, the newly appointed ambassador, uh, Andrew Bennett, has undertaken a mission to engage diplomatically around the world with representatives of states uh, using the language of faith and religion. And uh, he's doing so to promote religious freedom and adherence to that, that one particular human right. And he's using the language of religion because, and this is a paraphrase of public statements that he's made, because he is speaking with people who do not speak the language of human rights. So instead, he's speaking the language of faith. Given your reference to the Government of Canada's commitment to the promotion of the rule of law and international human rights through the Department of Justice, I wonder if you feel that the new Office of Religious Freedom and Justice Canada are rowing in the same direction, or is there uh, a risk they are actually working at cross purposes, one promoting international human rights and one saying we'll speak a different language when we have to? Um, it's a great question and it makes me very happy that I'm now a retired member from the Department of Justice so I get to answer this question not as a bureaucrat. Um, I, I think you, you, you raise a very good point. The fact is that um, the government sometimes speaks with forked tongue and I think it speaks to many audiences. And I think this Office of Religious Conscience or Freedom um, speaks to a certain segment um, of partisans that support the government. And I think that that was done, um, I, I don't know much about that particular office. I haven't been in government for, for uh, a couple of years. Um, so I think it speaks to that segment. Equally so, I could tell you that um, I know that the office that I was responsible for of international development, the Department of Justice, um, grew exponentially under this particular government than in any previous government. Um, my budget was minuscule uh, under a liberal regime, and it exploded, uh, curiously enough, uh, under a conservative government. And the truth was that the Prime Minister uh, noted in um, speeches in, in I, I mean, I could claim in the 2008 speech, budget throne speech and in subsequent speeches, he always talked about the fact that Canada would promote the notions of human rights, rule of law, democratization, and good governance. And that really is a fundamental notion of this government as well. And that's the type of work that they're actually putting their dollars to that. Uh, the seat of budget has actually grown um, in, in a number of respects under the Prime Minister. So 
it's a multifaceted, complex question that speaks with one hand over here, speaks with another hand over there. And, I, and, 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 and in an absolute nonpartisan fashion, I have to tell you that we are very lucky to have a foreign affairs minister who unabashedly will go out and support LGBT rights issues by when, when the Ugandan Speaker of the House was in Ottawa last year for a parliamentary conference, he just slammed her and said, you know, what is going on in your country? And then there's this whole big spat in the newspaper and stuff like that. He has written letters to the Russian uh, Duma. He's written letters um, um, in, in, um, uh, in Uganda. Uh, it was, it was, so there is an assertion on one side, and there's a voice of the LGBT community in cabinet that, that asserts rights. And yes, there's that office as well. Strange dichotomy. Um, I'm going to jump in it, since there's no one at the microphone. But actually, and I want to get you, Michael, to respond to a point the other Michael made, uh, talking about how as gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgendered rights are pushed for in certain countries, there's a push back. Uh, based on Michael's statement, what is Human Rights Watch finding on the ground? Yeah, I think that that's absolutely accurate. I know that uh, in the two days leading up to the current uh, hearing before the Supreme Court, uh, there was a huge church rally in Jamaica um, uh, of some 1,500 people, which in, in, in that country is, is a significant number, um, voicing their uh, opposition in advance of the hearing. So just letting their displeasure be known and wanting to make sure that the buggery laws are maintained. Um, and, and we certainly know that there, uh, I, I remember Lee spoke as well about the issues of corrective rape that that is a big concern um, for the, the lesbian community in, in Jamaica as well, who are subjected not only to elevated rates of sexual violence generally, but in particular are also subject to um, these uh, intentional acts that is designed to reorient someone. Um, so we are definitely seeing a, a, a backlash on the ground. But on a positive note, since we are in Pride Week, um, we are also seeing that NGOs are being emboldened as never before. Um, they, uh, where before our 2004 report, we would never have seen J Flag, for example, on, on the news, on television, uh, getting their, their message out. Now they are unabashedly speaking out in the press, um, daring the government or the police to attack them. I'm not so sure of the wisdom of that, but, uh, but it's happening in a way that it's not before. So we, we have two different uh, kinds of um, experiences on the ground uh, in Jamaica at the moment. Okay, um, and I'm sorry, we were pressed for time here. Uh, so I'm gonna allow one question here and then I'm gonna begin wrapping up because uh, the Premier will be uh, addressing uh, the reception. So feel free to. Uh, I, I'm, I want to thank Michael and Michael both for shining some of the spotlight on Jamaica. I know that um, Michael Batista was a little, would probably be a little bit hesitant uh, to be too much of an advocate for Rainbow Railroad. Um, I just want to provide a little bit more information about what is going on in the ground in Jamaica. Um, because our, we have some anecdotal evidence at Rainbow Railroad that, or with Rainbow Road, I'm a volunteer, um, that I think is helpful. Of the people that we helped last year, it included people who had their, a man who had had his throat slit. Throat slit. Uh, we've had two uh, incidents of people's houses being firebombed, uh, and our understanding is that a 17-year-old uh, gay man was actually killed in Jamaica last week. Um, the situation there is reasonably urgent. Um, some of it's as a result of uh, backlash from a court case, but some of it's also just a result of the way that the society functions. Um, and uh, I think that the work that Human Rights Watch is doing on the ground in Jamaica is extremely important, but I think it's also really important. You know, as lawyers, uh, we often talk intellectually. Um, the situations that we're talking about, not just in Jamaica, but around the world where LGBT rights are at risk are situations of rape and murder and violence, and they're very real. And um, as much as it's important to recognize the accomplishments, it's also really important to remember that people are suffering, and they're suffering for who they are. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.
Um, so thank you very much for your questions. I apologize that was a bit brief, but this started a little later than anticipated, and uh, a couple of speeches went longer than anticipated. Hey, hey. But it was great. <laughs> it was great. Uh, anyways, listen, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm going to uh, quickly, uh, Michael is going to leave some material with Human Rights Watch uh, out in the reception, yes. my understanding. R uh, Rainbow Railroad, the organization that uh, Michael spoke about, will have a table at the reception. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going now to invite uh, Paul to come up to the stage. He is the vice chair of SOJIC, and he has the closing remarks. Thank you for uh, taking part in this today. Um, on behalf of uh, the Law Society of SOJIC, uh, I just want to extend again uh, our appreciation to the panel uh, for generously donating their time. Uh, we have some uh, lovely parting guests, which my assistant will uh, <laughs> now hand out. Uh, but in addition, a uh, special thanks to our moderator, uh, the third Michael, uh, for taking the time away from uh, the CBC uh, to grace us with his presence. Uh, as uh, mentioned before, um, we will be having a reception upstairs, so if you're not familiar with the building, uh, make your way out the door, make your way to the left, the right, through the doors, up the stairs, or up the elevator, and you'll be on the second level. Then you'll turn left, and you'll see the reception. If you are at all confused, follow the crowd. Someone will know where the drinks are. Uh, but uh, we would like everyone to convene there. I know uh, some people will probably want to uh, come up and uh, say a few words to, to the panelists, but please, as much as possible, take your conversations uh, upstairs as soon as possible because uh, Premier Wynne uh, will be arriving within the next couple of minutes, and we'd like to have everyone ready for her remarks uh, shortly. So thank you again for attending, and uh, please continue to join us upstairs.